Okay, uh, I've gotten clearance that it is time uh, to begin uh, this debate. I, I, this is the second time our two guests have engaged in this debate. Uh, uh, today, uh, uh, they were here in Regina addressing the, uh, the, the National Association of uh, Vice Presidents Academic uh, from across Canada. Uh, and it was a very, very interesting uh, opportunity for all of them, uh, and as it will be for, for all of us. Uh, I mean, we're very fortunate uh, to have uh, Ian Clark and uh, our own Ken Coates here uh, today talking about uh, essentially the future of the post-secondary system, or the lack of a post-secondary system, and its lack of a future. Uh, is. Uh, uh, but let me just begin by introducing both of our guests because uh, they're really two remarkable uh, scholars. And as I said this morning, they fit into a, into a category that is very unique and that is the, the scholar practitioner. Uh, both of them have been engaged in, in administration, uh, public management, uh, public policy development, as well as uh, functioning at uh, highest levels uh, of scholarship. Um, Ian uh, has uh, recently published uh, two books on uh, post-secondary uh, education reform uh, and is a leading scholar. But he also has a, a, a career, I don't know, I haven't actually ever talked to him about his early academic career as a physical chemist, but uh, he has a PhD in chemistry from Oxford University in England. Uh, he also has a master's in public administration from um, Harvard's uh, Kennedy School, and he's also a graduate of the University of British Columbia. Uh, he has been uh, at the height of the public service in Canada, was the former uh, uh, Secretary of the Treasury Board, former Deputy Minister of Consumer and Corporate Affairs, uh, amongst other portfolios, and the President of the uh, Council of Ontario Universities, uh, as well as, uh, as uh, an Executive Director at the International Monetary Fund. So he, has, uh, he is a, a classic exemplar of that uh, scholar practitioner uh, role. Uh, uh, on, the other, on the other part of the debate, uh, which will be explained to you shortly, is uh, Ken Coates, uh, uh, our Canada Research Chair in Regional Innovation. This is, uh, Ken is not new to the University of Saskatchewan. He's a former dean uh, and a former uh, acting vice president and provost uh, of the University of Saskatchewan, most recently, he was Dean of uh, the Faculty of Arts at the University of Waterloo, Canada's high-tech hub, and he is an expert on uh, all things to do with innovation. Uh, so today uh, we're uh, going to be uh, having a debate on uh, the future of uh, Canada's uh, post-secondary system, what the future uh, holds for the universities, and this isn't a debate in the sense that many people would be familiar with, and I'm referring here, of course, to the CBC's uh, program, The Debaters, uh, there'll be, um, there'll be a much less uh, uh, emphasis on, uh, on voting points and, and humorous repartee, although that will be part of it uh, as well, uh, I can assure you. Uh, I think uh, the plan is to have um, Ian begin with a few comments, or Ken begin with a few comments, sorry, uh, and then uh, followed by Ian, and then a further elaboration of their, their each each uh, individual position. It's an important and profound debate that are facing Canadian universities. And in fact, I learned more this morning about the, the nature of the debate uh, than uh, attending endless dean's council meetings uh, and the other kinds of academic forums. So you're in for a treat. Uh, hang on. Uh, Ken, take it away. Well, thanks very much, uh, Ken. And Hello to both campuses of the University of Regina and colleagues in, at, at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to give a fairly brief introduction as to why I think change is, is needed. Um, Ian is going to pick up from there and give a few thoughts about that as well and then go on to talk about the kinds of things that he think, think should be done. And then I'm going to come back up and tell him why he's wrong. So that, that's a, we've decided that that's how it's going to go and then he gets the last word. Um, so he can tell you all why I'm wrong. And I think that's uh, designed to get sort of some discussion going. Um, one of the things you'll discover in our processes, in our conversations, is that both of us love universities a lot. Uh, we know all the good things about universities, the wonderful impact they have on students, how they can change careers, change lives, the research that actually has profound implications, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So get that out of the way first. We both love universities. 
Um, we have a little bit different view as to what the challenges are right now. And mine's probably a bit stronger than, than Ian's might be. But my simple point is, is that I think universities are in need of a fairly substantial change. Um, and that it's going to be very difficult. Um, it's going to be profoundly difficult for some universities and for the system as a whole. My starting point would be simply that universities have had a very, very long run of good luck. Uh, Well-deserved good luck in many instances. Um, I was a, the founding vice president academic of the University of Northern British Columbia. It opened in 1994. At that time, it was the first new university that had opened uh, in 25 years. And a lot of universities opened in the 1960s, early 70s, and this long sort of gap in between. Um, now we've opened a lot. Uh, new universities popping up, new campuses of existing universities, brand new institutions, university colleges and art, art schools that are transformed into universities. We've done an awful lot of universities created across the country. We've had a massive increase in the number of students going on to post-secondary education generally, but particularly to the university, university system. Our research funding has grown dramatically. Never enough, faculty can always ask for more. We've had, we've had wonderful new facilities built on campuses all across the country. The number of graduate students has doubled across Canada in the last, I think it's seven years or something like that. Huge, huge increases there. And to make sure we, make, we become as completely self-interested as a faculty member can possibly be, we now have the highest on average university faculty salaries in the world. Uh, in fact, technically we're behind Saudi Arabia, but I think Saudi Arabia doesn't really count as a competitive competitor to the kind of environment we have we have here. So we've done really well. Um, the university system has done well. The, the interest of our students and the parents who often pay for big parts of their education remains very strong. And here's where my need for change starts to sort of hit in. Um, a lot of that interest is, is, is founded on a very simple promise that universities continue to share. And it's the million dollar promise. You probably heard this. If you go to university and have a university degree, you will on average earn a million dollars more than a college graduate. And now the evidence is you'll earn $1.3 million more than a, somebody who has a high school graduate. That was a high school graduate. If somebody handed that in to you as an undergraduate paper in economics or sociology, you would give them an F for making that argument. Uh, and you'd be highly suspect because an average is an average. That means that some people probably make an awful lot more than a million dollars more than a high school or college graduate, but it also means that some actually make less. And when the answer basically is, and I've, we actually found a couple of university websites that say, come to university, you'll earn basically a million dollars more without qualifications, um, it's very misleading. And one of the things that we, we haven't done is actually challenge and question that particular number. So I think the university system is uh, at risk for some reasons that I'll explain. Number one, healthcare is eating government from the inside. The costs of meeting our healthcare challenges are going up uh, very dramatically. Um, education spending, post secondary education spending is going to be uh, basically squeezed out um, very significantly, and government deficits in many parts of the country. We're, we actually talked today to, to uh, Vice President Academics and, and VP Admins from across Canada, will be very much constrained by government you know, borrowing ability and deficits generally. We have also the problem, the national problem of the declining roles of universities in public affairs. The Council of Ontario Universities did a survey before, not the last election in Ontario, but the one before, where they wanted to find out where universities sat sort of in terms of the overall uh, public interest in universities. And I think it was either eighth or ninth or something on the list. It was quite a ways down. And when that was, you drilled down and said, well, what part are you interested in? Essentially, the overwhelming answer was accessibility which is a really nice way of saying, I want my son or daughter or grandson or granddaughter to go to university. That's the issue. Accessibility is the issue. Um, on the other side of the quality of institutions and the funding for research and faculty salaries and working load, not so much of an issue as well. It works the other way around. We have provinces in Ontario where we actually have a sharply declining population in terms of high school graduates. Um, they're talking about adding new universities to expand accessibility. In Alberta, where we have a huge number of students looking for university opportunities, um, they, haven't, they won't open up any more spaces. Interesting. Universities have business models that don't make a lot of sense. Um, you actually not very sustainable. Um, faculty salaries are, in fact, very high. And so what do we get? Higher tuition fees and a far greater reliance on contract lecturers. The expansion of sessional teaching is changing the very function and operation of universities in dramatic ways without sufficient attention to how that is actually affecting the whole university environment. Finally, we, in this particular area, we've also oversold the universities. University presidents, vice presidents, deans have been remarkable proponents for the university model, um, what I call the innovation equation. 
the innovation equation is very, very simple. It says, a lot, send a lot of students to university, fund a lot of basic research, set up a commercialization office or a tech transfer office, and you will have jobs, prosperity, and happiness across the entire land. It's a very simple model that has actually been replicated all around the world. Very simple innovation equation. Um, and we, the university system has promoted this very aggressively. Never really asked if it's working or not. And in fact, it does work a certain amount, but we've oversold it. We've oversold individual scientific projects, oversold the whole idea of graduate education, oversold the idea of universities as sort of the seedbed of entrepreneurship. Um, those are testable propositions, and we've chosen not to test them. So there's growing public concern, at least in my mind. Um, the employment experience of many university graduates. I don't know if you watched the debate the other night between Obama and, um, and Romney. Um, universities did not figure very prominently, except when they talked about student debt and how you pay off student debt. And Romney said this one thing. He said, you realize right now that 50% of university graduates in the United States are unemployed. Now, they fact-checked a whole bunch of things. They chose not to fact-check that one. It's actually not true. Um, but what the number is probably closer to is 50% of university graduates are either unemployed or underemployed. In Canada, 39% of university graduates are doing unskilled work. That's a staggering number. And if you just go down almost anywhere, go to a hotel, go to a, a, a Starbucks shop or whatever else, you'll find an awful lot of university graduates who, when they started off university, were not thinking they were going to end up doing an unskilled, low-paid job. But 39% in Canada, it's one of the highest in the OECD. Um, we don't, universities are not focusing enough on student outcomes at all. Um, university financial challenges don't interest government very much. And in fact, one of the things that really bothers governments about universities um, is how when they give more money, they just pass it on to the faculty. And we pass it on in one of two ways, either by giving faculty members higher salaries, uh, or benefit increases, or reduce workloads. Um, and so university governments are very frustrated with this because they get more money and then hear the same complaints about overcrowded classrooms and reliance on contract lectures and what have you. Um, thirdly, there's this wonderful phrase that I think is one of the real catastrophes in the modern university. And we don't challenge it often enough. It's the phrase, it's only academic. You probably hear this a thousand times a year. But what does that mean? Well, that means it's not relevant. It's not important, not timely, not significant, not pertinent, not useful. Not true also. Um, because an awful lot of faculty research has applications in terms of understanding the human condition, the natural world, but we let it go untested. In fact, we don't offer the counterbalance, which is to say, here's the way in which scholarly research is changing the world today, tomorrow, and 100 years from now, which is what the university system really should all be about. Finally, um, we would almost all agree that faculty-student ratios are going in the wrong direction. The classes are getting larger. They're being taught more by contract lecturers, uh, short-term people. Um, some of whom are brilliant teachers, by the way, but they're li living in, we had new people in, in the Waterloo region who were actually teaching at five different universities a year. Driving around one course here, one course here, down to McMaster, back over to York, back up and down. What a lovely life for somebody with a PhD and nine years of teaching experience. But when it comes down to it, and one thing that we don't talk enough about, is the fact that the student experience is suffering. That going to university is not what it used to be when I was young, which is now 140 years ago. But going to university is a very different thing than what we sell. Not very much access to professors. Um, a provost at my at the University of Waterloo a couple of times a year would, would phone around departments on Friday afternoon to see who was in the office. And he'd just make a note of who was there. And then he'd phone the dean and say, OK, I just phoned around. Half the time, the deans weren't there. But they were, we were out working on other, on other things. Um, and basically, you know, the student experience is not what we think we're selling. And I think we have to address these issues. We desperately need change. Over to Ian. So thank you very much, <clears throat> Ken. And uh, before I start, just let me say what a thrill it is for me to be back here in the Johnson Shoyama um, graduate school. Uh, Al Johnson was my first deputy minister, so when I went from uh, the Harvard Masters of Public Policy to Ottawa, Al Johnson was the Secretary of the Treasury Board. That's where I began my career. And uh, when I was a, uh, a young, ambitious analyst and 
got a project where I had to make a presentation to all the deputy ministers in Ottawa. Um, the presentation that I made, this is with Al Johnson, but it was um, at the Tommy Shoyama Chair Deputy Ministers 10 Committee, as it was called in those days. And uh, so these are uh, giants uh, in my mind, and it's a, a thrill to be back. At the other point, I, I, I will just say, I, I mentioned this in front of the uh, academic vice presidents, is uh, one of my roles is as the chair of the accreditation board of the APA, which is the Canadian Association of Programs for Public Administration, and we have uh, just been through the accreditation of the Johnson Shoyama programs, which came out with dramatically flying colors. And uh, I use the Johnson Shoyama website, its whole approach, its integration as a model in talking with other schools across the country, both existing schools and, and ones which are thinking uh, of uh, coming together. So this is, uh, it's wonderful to be here. I, on, uh, I've got a storyboard on there which I'll, uh, I will speak to, and most of these, all of these uh, uh, charts uh, support the points that Ken was making, and I will elaborate on a couple of them. You might wonder, well, where's the debate? And the debate will come when um, I make the case that governments are going to be needed as partners and even as drivers of the needed reform. And Ken will rebut uh, by saying that universities are capable of doing it themselves and governments may make it worse. So that's, that's where the debate part comes in. But in terms of <clears throat> where we are and why reform is necessary, um, the first point, the first bullet, is there have been a number of compelling critiques of the university model. This applies throughout North America, indeed, most of uh, OECD countries. And I'll just start with the first one um, that many, like the former uh, presidents we have in the room, uh, will recognize is the uh, Boyer Commission analysis of what, of how undergraduate education was being shortchanged in American research universities and what uh, research universities uh, can and should do about it. Soon after that, um, the Alan Tupper, who is an old uh, colleague of uh, Ken Rasmussen and myself uh, in the public administration field, um, and, uh, and his uh, colleague, uh, Professor Pockington, published this No Place to Learn book, which again was a critique of how universities are putting too much emphasis on narrow areas of research and not enough emphasis on the teaching. My former president of Harvard, uh, Derek Bach, uh, followed with uh, our underachieving colleges. Again, same kind of themes in those. And then uh, the next one on that list is the book that I, with uh, three other colleagues, uh, published on Ontario called Academic Transformation, looking at the forces that were reshaping higher education. And one of the, we thought that was all we um, had to say. But as we spoke with uh, university leaders across the country, and particularly in Ontario, uh, about the uh, conclusions they draw from these forces that were reshaping, the university administrators would tell us, uh, usually off the record, that we had underestimated the difficulties and that they felt that they were um, stuck, trapped in a situation where, as administrators themselves, they could not uh, undertake the needed reform. So we then, uh, with the help of stimulation of Ken Coates's book uh, and analyses like that, said, okay, if government has a role to play, 
what should it do? Uh, you know, what specifically could a government do? <clears throat> and we took Ontario as the case study uh, to help universities undertake what we thought were the needed reforms. But looking quickly at uh, the charts, so on the second one just notes the point of the million dollar promise that um, Ken referred to, and that is personal incomes on average increase uh, with the years of education. But as Ken noted, um, there's uh, dotted lines above and below the average, and in some fields of study and, uh, and some experiences they don't, and some they do very well. But that general, that general line being up means that from an individual's perspective, there will always be an interest to lots of Canadians to go to universities, which puts a particular obligation on universities, which are the gatekeepers, the credential providers. They have an oligopolistic position. You can't go anywhere to get a, a university degree. You have to go to a university. Um, that they have, they have an obligation, therefore, to provide that degree in the highest quality uh, most cost-effective way possible. Um, charts three and four just note that there's been an, an issue in the engagement in the undergraduate learning process, both on students' part and on faculty's part. So those, those charts just so over time, the number of hours per week that students spend studying to their academic work has been steadily declining. It was about, these are American, this is American data, but it applies to uh, selective universities and uh, less selective universities, the whole gamut, that when I was going to university, we used to study on average 40 hours a week. Um, now, it's uh, closer to 27 hours a week. It's kind of a 1% decline every year. And on the faculty's part, uh, and in the old days, faculties used, most faculty members would teach what we call now a three plus three load, three, three uh, courses in one semester, three courses the next semester. And now the average is about two plus two or less. Well, that's a two thirds uh, reduction over that period. So that leads to less engagement uh, between faculty and students. The next bullet is uh, tantalizing technology. And um, this has been, it's tantalizing because as the, the cost curve uh, chart five notes that the average cost of providing a course, at least putting it online, uh, diminishes uh, precisely proportional to the number of people that uh, view the course. So it looks like there's a magic there. You can get the cost of delivery of higher education down to a vanishingly uh, small number. Of course, there's, it's not as easy as simply putting something up online. But the notion of technology changing uh, the way higher education can and should be delivered has been talked about for a couple of decades now. Um, in 1997, uh, Peter Drucker, so that was uh, 15 years ago, Peter Drucker, uh, the famous uh, management guru, said, in 30 years, campuses will be relics. Uh, we will be receiving our higher education in totally different ways. So we're halfway through those 15 years, those 30 years. Um, this campus is not a relic. Uh, the University of Saskatchewan uh, campus is a very beautiful non-relic. Uh, so it hasn't happened that quickly, uh, but um, as the uh, professors of disruptive technology uh, theorize that these changes don't happen in a steady way, they kind of build to a point and then they start happening quite quickly. And so there are some people who are saying that uh, Drucker may not be completely right with the 30 years, but there may be a lot more dramatic change in the next 50. Yeah, the next 50. So uh, that is something that 
all university leaders uh, have to be thinking about. The biggest, the big issue, and the most, uh, which has a, almost a moral dimension to it, in my view, is the unaffordable inflation element, uh, where uh, faculty, the costs of running universities, which is primarily in faculty compensation, have been increasing substantially faster than the incomes of Canadians. So that's uh, the median incomes of Canadians, and applies to Americans as well, um, has been essentially constant for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, whereas faculty uh, compensation has been increasing at two or three or four or five percent every year. And what that means, of course, um, is that for any fixed amount of tuition plus a fixed amount of government uh, contribution, you get fewer and fewer faculty per student. Um, and as Ken pointed out the, on the seventh chart, just notes that all the projections are that from a government's perspective, the cost of health um, is going to continue to increase, so it will be crowding out the expenditures on all other programs, presumably including on higher education. So this crunch um, is coming, uh, and it will affect uh, universities in probably all provinces, but certainly uh, my province of Ontario. Um, so um, my argument uh, in the second uh, set of bullets is that government impetus, impetus will be needed because universities are trapped, they're collectively trapped um, in a number of ways. The first thing is all of them are competing uh, over status. Um, and what kind of status? Well, the nature of universities has evolved so that status is typically associated with the research mission of universities. So there's been pressure on faculty, going to box nine, lovely phrase, uh, scholarship at gunpoint. So scholars uh, are expected to perform because to help them get more status, to help this institution get more status, so, which leads, in Philip Altbach's term, to institutional isomorphism. That is, all the institutions begin to look the same, and they aspire to look the same. And uh, the disengagement issue um, that we discussed earlier, and George Koo puts a, a nice term on this, he says that it looks like students and professors have developed a disengagement pact where the professors say, I won't assign too much difficult reading and writing to you if you don't bug me very much about why you're not getting good marks um, and uh, come around too often for your advisement uh, hours. Um, obviously, those are, these are all generalizations. There are uh, wonderfully engaged faculty in all of our institutions, but the averages, those trend lines, uh, are worrying. That's the competition over status. The second uh, bullet there is uh, this, what I've called the te teaching research orthodoxy. This, it is a matter of faith ordering on religious belief by virtually all faculty members um, that you can't be a good teacher unless you are an active researcher. Um, and the, there's been actually been a lot of research on this subject, and the answer is consistent and unequivocal. There is no relationship. There is no correlation. There are very good teachers and very good researchers. You don't have to be a very good researcher to be a very good teacher. You have to be scholarly. You have to have a scholarly frame of mind. You have to be committed to uh, scholarship but you don't have to be at the world's leading edge of chemistry, physics, English literature uh, in order to be a compelling, engaging, um, and highly successful teacher. 
So if that's the case, then these decline in hours of week, hours of uh, teaching per week that we see in four are uh, easily reversible without uh, reducing teaching quality, one would think. That is, you can get faculty to spend less time on research and more time on teaching, you'll get better uh, teaching quality from the institution as a result. Um, but, given the competition of our status, uh, there's a huge reluctance among institutions to differentiate themselves both within their institutions to have teaching streams, professors and research stream professors, or to, dis to differentiate among institutions, have more research-oriented institutions, more teaching-oriented institutions. Um, and as I say, the, the reluctance uh, is based on a lot of things, but it has almost a religious uh, ferocity about it. Um, I, I developed <coughs> the chart in uh, chart 11, which I'll just explain briefly. You don't have to see it in detail, but it's based on the observation, um, which is kind of commonsensical when you think about it, that not all faculty are equally productive researchers. And you can do tests yourself on this if you want um, by taking your any professor that you know or any list of professors in any faculty you know um, and then go on to Google Scholar and look at how many citations there are to their works, which is a proxy for how much effect their research is having on the world uh, at large. And what you'll find in the little experiment that I did in a field that I know that I'm able to judge roughly uh, uh, the publication uh, value is in political science. So I took, uh, looked at the so-called H index uh, of political scientists at the associate professor rank in three different universities. You can probably uh, imagine which ones they were, but they were, they were in, in Ontario and they ranged from the, the H index, which is the number of papers you have with a number of citations equal to that amount. Um, they range from zero, so this is 19, 19 associate professors. They range from zero, so this professor had no published work which had been cited by anyone else, up to 19, which means they had 19 publications which had been cited by at least 19 people each. It's a crude indicator, uh, but it's easy, and it's, it, 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 it sort of comes up uh, you can calculate it easily by uh, doing your, this on uh, Google Scholar. There's many more sophisticated uh, techniques you can use using more sophisticated bibliometric measures than Google Scholar. You could look at, you could also add elements such as uh, research grants from the granting councils and so on. But the point is, if you look at any group of faculty members, they don't, they aren't equally uh, research productive. So if you put them on a, if you plot their research productivity uh, by deciles, you get the kind of plot you see in the blue line in the, in the lower left, which is what uh, analysts call a power law function, uh, where in this case, and it looks like it, it may be fairly general, 70% uh, of the output is produced by the top 30% of the researchers. So if under scenario A, everybody is teaching and researching the same amount, then you get a total output of scholars of uh, research, a total output of teaching of a certain amount. So now in scenario B, you say t you do what you do in any business or any other part of life, you'd specialize. Those that are good at this, you'd say do more of that. Those that are good at that, you'd say do more of that. So in scenario B, for the top 30% of researchers, you say 
we'll give you course relief for one course. Instead of teaching two and two and two, sorry, two and two, you teach one and two and spend that additional time doing research. For the rest, you say instead of doing teaching two courses and two courses, teach two courses and three courses. Um, what do you get in this simple model? You get 20% more research output and 20% more teaching. Miracle. Um, that's, it's just the economies of specialization that were discovered um, the first time people started uh, planting crops and, uh, and doing anything in groups. So um, we really should differentiate uh, in order to give taxpayers uh, and students better value for money. The next uh, point is the distorted labor markets. And uh, Ken noted that Canadian faculty salaries are the highest in the world. Um, the market out there, um, I happen to be sitting on a, on a uh, selection panel to hire new professors in, a, in one of the uh, faculties at the University of Toronto. The, the amount of brilliant scholars who are on the market uh, who would absolutely love to come and work and teach under any conditions. You could ask them to teach. You could ask them to teach four courses a term. Uh, they would love to come to our universities. Um, you know, it's it's amazing. So these are the statistics in box 13 in Ontario. There are five PhD holders in Ontario for every person who's on a faculty. Um, there we, we get in Ontario 4.4 new PhDs from both what we graduate and who immigrate to Ontario. 4.4 uh, new PhDs for every professor who is retiring. So the, the market is such we could hire fantastic uh, professors without having to pay the highest salaries in the world if one didn't want to. Um, Ken mentioned uh, what's happening with uh, the use of part-time and sessional uh, uh, teachers, and box 14 shows why. Uh, the cost uh, for teaching a, a one-term course for a full-time professor making $100,000 is one quarter times $100,000. Uh, and if you, if you, sorry, if you add, if you add the benefits part, uh, of 20% of that comes to $30,000. So it costs $30,000 for the average professor to teach a course. You can hire a sessional structure instructor with a PhD uh, for about $7,500, i.e. one quarter. Well, how do you think that university administrators uh, balance their books when they are faced with constantly increasing compensation budgets and uh, flatlined uh, overall revenues from tuition um, and provincial grants. The final uh, box um, is, the, is uh, box 14, which just notes how skeptical Canadian institutions, and certainly Ontario institutions, are of other models. So if you run, if you look at the numbers in the California system, and you combine the University of California and California State University uh, together, um, even though California is three times as big as Ontario, uh, the university system is only 1.3 times as big. It's actually quite comparable because in, on, in California, of course, there's lots of private universities and other things. So it's a, not a bad comparison. And it turns out, you crunch all the numbers, California average faculty salary is 16% lower. The average teaching load is 43% higher. The semester length in California is 15 weeks compared with 12 or 13 weeks in Ontario. You put those numbers together, California students in the public system in California get over twice as many contact hours with full-time faculty as we do in Ontario. And then here's the real kicker for me. 
what does California spend in its public university system on the faculty time that's devoted to research? It turns out these numbers because uh, there are fewer full-time professors who are on this two plus two teaching that California spends 21% less on faculty time for research than Ontario does. And compare the results. The University of California says it's had 27 Nobel Prize winners since 1995. Ontario's uh, last Nobel Prize winner was 1986 with John Pine. Um, California institutions have five of their universities in the Times Higher Education Top 50. Uh, Ontario has one. So no one, not even Ontarians, would claim that uh, California is not getting way more research output from its system and yet paying less for the faculty time for research. So that's an extreme example. California's held up historically as a system which was, through public policy from the 60s, was highly differentiated and built that way. Um, it would be impossible, maybe inappropriate, for Canadian provinces to go to that extreme. But it does show the kind of improved uh, value that's uh, possible, both on teaching and research, uh, from better uh, system management and uh, more uh, specialization differentiation. So let me stop there. And the implications of this for me are because universities are collectively trapped in these phenomena, that it does require government to help universities undertake uh, the necessary reforms. Yeah. So it falls to me to give you a bit of an argument as to why the university should take the lead in this change. And I think Ian's going to come back afterwards and challenge that a little bit with some of his ideas. But I just want to elaborate on a couple of things. You know, we have to really question our, our, the system that we have as to whether it's actually achieving its goals. And the number I read a while ago was it's 80% of all the scientists who were ever alive in the history of the world are alive today. And that number will be about 90% within 10 years, which is because of the growth of the university system in Asia and, and South Asia. Um, what that resulting in is a huge explosion in the publications, more journals, more articles. And we know that not only are students reading less, but we actually know that faculty members are reading a lot less. So we're producing more material, we're reading less of it, it's kind of intriguing. My son just took on a teaching job in Ontario, at Ontario University. It's his third year of being a professor, and we sat down last weekend, and he was really perplexed, and he said, be honest, I, I enjoy it, um, but I don't know why I'm doing it. Uh, the students don't really seem to be interested in learning. And you assign readings, and they don't do the readings, and they're not bothered by it. They're not bothered by not having done the readings and what have you. And I saw, he gave me this, this uh, cartoon that he sent along, and it's got this wonderful sort of, sort of a you know, joke in the middle of it, where this one guy is saying to a student that as it becomes easier to get a degree, the dumber you look for not having one which is a, a huge incentive to do what? I mean, go and, go and get a degree, even if you don't sort of really, really need one. Um, my sense at Caden Universities, to put a starting point on this, is that at Caden Universities, really all Caden Universities, you have a chance to get an absolutely wonderful education. It's not a guarantee, though. You used to do a degree is supposed to be a guarantee that you have a certain set of skills. And I think right now, uh, we're getting a lot of pressure for the reasons that, that Ian's described. Faculties are supposed to change. Universities are supposed to change. A lot of emphasis on retention efforts and things of that sort. Um, I would suggest to you we're nowhere near demanding enough on students. We don't, you know, when you're talking to students at the beginning of the year, we very, rel very rarely stand up and say, this is a 45 to 60 hour a week job. And if you think you can do a university degree without doing less than 45 to 60 hours a week, you're wrong. We don't do that because we're afraid they'll give us a bad review at the end of the day. Um, we also need, some of you, it's on the, the board up there, but um, some of you may have read a book called Academically Adrift. It's a really excellent sort of study that basically asks the question, are we actually giving the students the skills we say we're giving? 
critical thinking, analytical research, and what have you. Their answer, based on a lot of research, is essentially no. That the universities are adding very little transformative value to the students who are there. So my point to pick up very, where, where Ian was, was uh, leaving off is that we have a simple choice. We have to create a culture of change in universities, or as Ian's hinted, the governments will do it for you, and they'll actually also do it to you as institutions. Um, so what do I say to that? Well, number one, be nervous. Be really, really nervous. Governments, if you ask their, the position of public statements by politicians, they say all the right things. They truly love us. They love universities and they love giving access and they love our research and what have you. But I think they're saying words that are very different from what we think they're saying. Because what the university means is we want career ready graduates. We don't want graduates, we want career ready graduates, people who can move into the, the workforce with very tight connections to business. We want the students not to be critics of society, uh, poets or what have you, we want them to be able to get a job in the exact fields where their the interest is right now. What does that mean? More applied science, more health, more business, less humanities, less social sciences and fine arts. They love research, particularly if it leads to commercial products, which leads to more businesses, which leads to more jobs, which leads to more wealth, which leads to more taxes, which they might give a little bit back to the universities. They want also lower tuition fees. It would be harder to get the money to pay for this. We have a very inflexible tuition fee regime in Canada. It should be much more flexible. Um, they also want and demand greater accessibility. This is the number one issue for politicians. They want to make sure that all of their constituents' children can go to university because if the children get turned down, the parents phone and complain uh, about that and then you get in trouble for that particular way. Um, they want us to pay more attention to student success, but they also don't want us to be too demanding of students in the process. They don't want us to fail them out. About a third of all students who start off in university in Canada don't complete. Um, staggering sort of numbers. And if you actually, depends on how you do the calculations, but if you have 100 students starting off in universities, at the end of the day you probably get about 35 or so who end up in university related careers. It's not a very high number. Um, and we should be very, very concerned about that. Universal governments are also not all that interested in curiosity-based research, particularly if the curiosity is about government. Um, there's very little tolerance for university collegial processes. When you go up and say, well, we're trying to get that through the Senate, but you know there's some really cranky people on the Senate, and they're complaining all the time, and council won't approve it. Um, government's just like, then make them. They're employees, make them. The understanding of faculty autonomy is not very clear and they will be very, very concerned about faculty salaries. So essentially what's going on too is that over the last number of years, one of the uh, uh, charts on there shows this, is government has paid less and less of the total cost of universities. Tuition's covered more in the last, uh, last decade or so. And we've gone from what used to be called government-funded universities, because they were the lion's share of the money, to what some people are trying to call government-supported, making the point that governments actually are not all that involved in the financing of it. So isn't it ironic that governments are talking about having more control when they're actually spending less money? Um, we actually have a situation in Canada where several of our universities could go private. Um, if they could walk off the government, government sort of subsidy thing and sort of start charging full, full market value, um, the University of Waterloo could go private. Bishops almost did this. They had a debate about this at Bishops. They came very close to doing it. But Waterloo, if they increased their overall income, or overall tuition fee to twelve or $14,000 to make up for the lost government income and stuff, um, they would probably be successful. Um, but we're not going to be allowed to do that because we're government supported or government controlled. Um, so universities don't want to cede control. I think governments you know, are, are our friends, but the idea that universities would cede control to the government is a really interesting one. The universities do not want to sur surrender their autonomy. In a very unhelpful intervention, the Ontario faculty unions declared in response to a planning paper in Ontario um, that they wa wanted to defend the, the right of the faculty-controlled senates and, and councils to make the decisions about whether we went to three-year degrees, whether we um, a, a offered uh, on a 12-month basis and worked over the summertime and what have you. Governments don't understand universities all that well. Some individuals do, um, but not necessarily the whole system and certainly not the political process. They don't understand the internal dynamics. One aspect of universities that's really hard to explain is how three or four really cranky people can hold up almost any initiative on almost any campus. They get themselves on the right boards, right commissions, the dean reappointment committees, the presidential search committee. Uh, they get on a, on a council or they go on the, the, you know, the curriculum advisory committee or something like that and can slow really good ideas down for a year or two or three or make it, basically make them disappear. The government doesn't understand that. 
Um, they also don't understand this unique character and mandate of, in, in, of universities. Each university is different. It has a history and a culture of its own. Um, we do have to make universities less faculty-centric, but we don't want them to lose their connection to their place, their sense of place, and what have you. Um, and I'm also very concerned with the fact that universities, uh, governments, don't often get their decisions right. If you look at the pattern of teacher education, for example, we often expanded in response to a temporary bulge in enrollment, and then we produce an enormous number of students, uh, graduates. Uh, in Ontario right now, in the last year, of, in 1970, 70%, um, 1980 I guess it was, 1980, 70% of newly produced teachers got full-time teaching jobs within the, the four months, basically, of graduating. Um, the number this year was 23%. 23% of people with B.Ed. degrees actually got a teaching job, mostly because they wouldn't move out of Toronto, but that's another issue for another day. Um, but 30% of them had nothing, no job whatsoever. It is hardly a success for a university to claim that. We have to tidy that up ourselves. The government decided a number of years ago to expand teaching. Now Ontario is talking about solving the problem by making students go to university for two years instead of one to get a teaching certificate. Not a very good solution. Um, so, and the other problem is that if governments are successful, um, they'll set a pattern that will be very difficult to break. Once they get going down this line and get their teeth into the, the, the ankle of the university system, they won't really let go very quickly. So I asked a post-secondary minister, somebody who'd been a minister a few years back, he's not from Saskatchewan, um, what he thought about this kind of issue. Number one thing he said was, if we give you more money, you just give it to faculty salaries and we don't want to do that anymore. So in fact, they are wanting to take control because we don't think we spend it very well. Second thing he said was that governments should set the vision uh, for the system. Let, leave the nuts and bolts as to how people fit in, but let set, set the vision. So my example for that is in Ontario, a couple of years ago, about five or six years ago, the government decided to, to double the number of graduate students. Set a big competition among the universities. We want 47, we want 147, we want 347. And they all fought against each other for a portion of this. I remember talking to the minister at the time and saying, well, why don't you tell us where you want the graduate students to be? Because quite frankly, there isn't a huge demand for more PhDs in English. We massively overproduce in English. It's a wonderful degree, but we already produce way too many. Um, and he said, well, we don't want to interfere with university autonomy. So guess what we did? We really have a lot more engineering graduates. That's what they wanted. A lot more graduates in applied health. Not too many. But I'll tell you, we have a lot more English graduates. We have a whole bit, three time jump in, in PhDs in English at the University of Waterloo alone. Huge increase in the number of history majors and political science majors, not bad things. I think those are wonderful. I'm a historian by training. But the government set the vision and left the details to us, and oops. You know, they, they just gave us the money, and we competed for it. In Ontario, you got $46,000 in capital money for every student you recruited. And it was an unseemly mess of watching us, you know, you're only 72%, but you're, you're in. You know, we're, because we need that $46,000. Next year, we don't need you. We'll fill you out. But we need that $46,000 right now. And so we went, went after it very, very aggressively. Most ominously, the thing he said also was he said, you know, we got visited a lot by university presidents. And the university president said, it really helps if you, set, if you guide us. It really helps if you tell us what we should do. And then, and then we'll respond internally. But it really helps if we have an external person telling us what to do. But what does it say when you assemble among the smartest group of people anywhere in the country, pick any university at random, all these people with PhDs and master's degrees and years of experience, they're fabulous researchers, they understand how the world operates, you turn them together and say, we're not going to expect you to solve your own problems. That's crazy. It's just really crazy. But here's the other thing that happened. We were visited uh, in one province I was in before by a member of the opposition party, which was about a two or three months away from, from being elected. And the leader of the opposition party came to the university and said, I'm really here to help. I love universities. Universities are absolutely great. And we know you want to change. And our president at the time said, yes, yes, we really want to change. We're in touch with the times and all that kind of stuff. He said, well, here's what we're going to do for you. We're going to hold back 15% of your budget. And we're going to give it to you if you do new things. So that way, you can take this hold back, get rid of all the things you don't want to do anymore, because you all know what they are. You know, that Department of Antarctic Studies that you don't want anymore, you can get rid of it, close it down, and then come over here with the Department of Dance, and we'll add the Department of Dance. And I, I thought the president was going to faint. Like, Please don't do this. You know, a 15% cut at a university in, anywhere in Canada would be absolutely catastrophic. And you wouldn't end up closing the programs down because of faculty contracts and 
collective agreements and all this, all this kind of stuff. So it's not going to be easy. There are tons of reasons why this is going to be hard. Which university in Canada will voluntarily switch from being a research intensive university to being a teaching intensive institution? Which one will do exactly what Ian has targeted said there? No, nope. everybody says, well, we have a regional mandate. No, we're the one for Southwestern Ontario. We're the one for Northern British Columbia. We, we can't stop doing research. They're not talking about this kind of thing. A lot of universities are going this way by default for financial reasons. McMaster, whatever research intensive university, has a university teaching professor program now. They hire people who are very just teachers, and it's wonderful. UBC has it as well. Lots of places have it. But imagine a whole university president, president coming in and saying, okay, University of, of, of you know, Northern Ontario, there isn't one. Um, you are now going to be a, a teaching intensive institution. We're going to scale back. We're going to change the teaching arrangements, all that kind of stuff. Um, that president would have the shortest lifespan of any uh, university president in history. Um, we know the barriers. We are very slow changing. Universities are incredibly, incredibly slow to change. Um, our decision making processes are way too uh, unresponsive. They're controlled by opponents. Many universities think we can wait out governments. If you don't like this minister, wait a couple of months, you'll get a new one. You know, the deputy minister will complain a little bit, maybe you'll get a new deputy minister. Um, and the government will change in time. As long as we can hold on until that next election, everything will work out as well. Also, last barrier, universities have given away most of the tools they need for effective management. You cannot replace faculty members fast enough. We make General Motors look like a high-tech startup company. You cannot move people out of the professoriate fast enough. So if you've got a department over here in Antarctic Studies that has one student in it, it's really, really hard to shut that department down and to go over to this other area where there's a huge demand. It's extremely difficult. To use my own faculty at University of Waterloo when I was there as an example, we had 14 faculty members studying Germany and we had two faculty members doing research on Asia. And if you think that's a model for 21st century Canada, it's absurd. But we'd hired them in good faith and good judgment back you know, 25, 30 years ago. And when the department, when people came to retire, 30 years on, did they come and say, time for us to hire a Chinese historian or a Chinese political scientist? No. They had courses on the books in German politics. So we had to, they wanted to hire in German politics. But what we can do, there are lots of things to do. Universities can, can make, uh, make this a really exciting, dynamic process. We can look at differentiation, as Ian's already suggested, in a major way. We can mobilize the research and analytical talent on a campus. It's a marvelous sort of idea to actually get the, the researchers there to start looking at themselves, the system, the local economy, local society, and what have you. Uh, we're not, we don't do very good in that. We actually come up with our, our innovative, our, our, our academic plans for universities look pretty much alike, um, small variations. We don't get very many calls for oceanography in Saskatchewan, so we have a little bit different program than Memorial or Dalhousie. They're not so good on prairie agriculture either. But beyond that, we actually are all looking at teaching, research, graduate studies, outreach, and internationalization. But we can actually tackle this ourselves. We can make it a high-end, campus-wide, interdisciplinary, exciting kinds of things. We must, in the process of doing this, engage constantly with government. They're not opponents. They're not enemies. The governments are wonderful people with way too few resources, way too few staff people working on very, very difficult things. But we can show them that we are trying to change and get their input into that change. But the most important thing I would say is the university has to decide up front if it's going to make difficult decisions, if it's actually going to close down faculties, down, down departments, close down programs, release faculty members in areas where there's not sufficient demand, uh, whether they're going to stay with the status quo or whether we're going to make the kind of changes that would be responsive in this kind of direction. Uh, if we're not, then what we're going to do is listen really carefully to what Ian says right now about what we're going to do instead. Again, it's uh, a bit hard to uh, have a debate with someone when you agree with 99% uh, <laughs> of what he says. But I would, uh, I guess the one point that I'd like to emphasize here just in closing, and I guess this is my biggest word, is that if neither government nor universities take these trends sufficiently seriously to say, we do have to change something, then what will happen? These curves will just continue. Um, faculty salaries will keep rising faster than Canadians' uh, median income. 
Um, faculty will continue to teach less and less. Um, and the student faculty ratios will get worse and worse. And the overall educational experience uh, of Canadians at the undergraduate level will get worse and worse. And that is a pretty awful outcome from the perspective of all of those of us, as Ken says, who love universities and uh, feel so passionately about uh, what their mission is. Um, let me close on that point, Ken. Open it for questions.